Hey, thanks for clicking on this video and checking out our church service. Whether you're new to Salem or you've been coming for a while, welcome and we hope you enjoy the service. To skip to different parts of the video, we do have chapter markers in the description box below. So click on one of those to be taken directly to that portion of the service. Our website has a lot more information about us. So if you're looking for information, check out our website at salemcovenant.org. If you're in the Duluth Superior area, you are welcome to join us at a service anytime. And if you're watching from afar, we hope and we pray that we can be an encouragement to you and partner with you for about an hour to help you encounter God, equip people, and extend the gospel. All right, grab your Bible, lean forward, and join us. Good morning, Salem. Good morning. Good morning, Salem Online. I'm Jesse. I get to be the host this morning, and it is my privilege to greet you guys here. And then also, I'd like to extend an extra uh, greeting to the fathers today because it is Father's Day. So happy Father's Day. Um, and if you don't have a father or something like that, or if they've passed on, well, we have a heavenly father that we can celebrate today with. So as we press into worship today, let's celebrate. I think it's, it's something worthy to celebrate and it's a beautiful day outside finally for, it feels like it's been winter up until uh, you know basically July, but it's been fantastic that we can have a beautiful day on Father's Day. So anyways, um, we have the Olsons. Uh, they are with the Black Forest Academy. They'll be coming in and they'll be speaking to us a little bit later in the service. So uh, if we can give them a round of applause, they're sitting right there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, now with that, we have the announcement video. Hey, what's up, YouTube? Here's what's up at Salem. Thanks for checking out Salem Online. Now, if you want to get connected with us here at Salem, uh, please consider filling out the Digital Connect card linked in the description box below and fill that out with as much information as you feel comfortable sharing. Uh, and later on, someone from Salem will reach out to you to connect with you and answer any questions you may have about our church. Stephen is planning a trip to Israel, May 2023 and he is having an information meeting on July 17th in between the two services in the remedy tomorrow June 20th we are having our annual congregational ministry meeting here in the sanctuary at 6 30 p.m. we will be uh, zooming that meeting so if you can't make it in person please see if you can join us via zoom all right, next weekend, our Sunday service is not going to be here at Salem. It's going to be at camp because it is the Salem family getaway, June 25th through the 26th. Uh, you need to register with camp if you wanna stay overnight or you can just go to camp, go home, and then go back to camp. Uh, it is a 35 minute drive from the church, so be aware of that. It also starts at 10 a.m. on Sunday, not nine, not 10.45, but 10 a.m. Uh, we are not live streaming it because we don't have a good way to live stream at the camp. Uh, and also, if you want to be baptized, please contact Stephen. This is your last week to contact him uh, if you wanna take your next step in your walk with Jesus. Salem Kids Camp, our VBS is coming up at the end of August. And so we are planning and prepping. So please, if you are interested in helping, uh, contact me and uh, we'd love to get you plugged in. Uh, we need a ton of volunteers. Uh, the only way that camp happened last year is because of all of the volunteers who sacrificed uh, their time and their energy and their talents to help make camp a success. So uh, we need your help again uh, this year. So if you're interested in helping out at Salem Kids Camp, please contact me. All right, that's it for the announcements this week. And so uh, up next, all right, that's it for the announcements this week. So if you need more information, head to SalemCovenant.org. So up next, we have our worship team that will come and lead us in worship. And the lyrics are gonna be on the bottom part of this screen for you to follow along with however you feel comfortable. And as you engage with us over the next hour or so through the music and the message, we hope and we pray that you encounter God. Hi, uh, I got a call about my son, Ben. Oh yes, Mr. Mason. He's in with the principal. He'll be out in a minute. 
This is it. My first serious teachable moment. A chance for me to impart the wisdom of my life to my son. If he thinks he can get into whatever he did at school and get away with it, no sir, not this dad. Look at him, like a sponge, ready to soak up all my life experiences. Maybe I'll tell him about the time we, no, no, he is not ready for that story yet. How did the TV dads do it? Like Mr. Tanner? Or Dunphy? Or the great Mr. Belding? Wait, he was the principal. Maybe he was a dad. Doesn't matter. This is going to be awesome. I'll start with a relatable story, then show how I thought I was cool by doing something wrong, and wrap it up by how bad it got and what I learned. Finally, bring it home with a scripture and a prayer. Dad, look at me now. I'm finally a father. And both Ben and I will remember this moment as the turning point in his life. And it begins in three, two. Mr. Mason. Mr. Mason, <laughs> thanks for coming in. Ben is free to go now. You know, it was really great how he stood up for those other kids. He's not in trouble? <laughs> no, he's not in trouble. But my moment. You should be very proud of Ben. Great job, Dad. Psalm 134 says, Praise the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who minister by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and praise the Lord. May the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, bless you from Zion. Open the way The day you gave your life Seemed a failure in our eyes But the stone you rolled away As you walked out of that grave Let this place erupt with praise Why do you look for the living Among the grave? Jesus lives, all the earth sing out. The power of death has been broken. This changes everything. God of perfection became sin. God of salvation changed everything. gave your life seemed a failure in our eyes but the stone it rolled away as you walked out of that grave let this place erupt with praise why do you live for the living among the grave all the earth sing out The power of death has been broken This changes everything Because you live
This changes everything. This changes everything. Because you live, our hope begins. Because you live, our song will never end. Because you live. Is everything let this place erupt with praise? Why do you look for the living among the grave? Jesus lives, all the earth sing out. Power of death has been broken, this changes everything.
How wonderful and my song shall ever be How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me How marvelous and how wonderful are you, Lord. It, it just feels like sometimes our words just can't do enough to describe how amazing you are, and, and we try our best, and that's what we come up with, Lord, is amazing and marvelous and wonderful, and that's, that's what you are to us, Lord. We thank you.
Oh Lord, that you would give us a stake in, in your blood that covers over us and, and washes us clean of our sins and bring this, brings us into right relationship with you, Lord. Uh, when we stumble and fall away, God, when our, when our hearts left unchecked, uh, drift into sin and rebellion from you, Lord, you pursue us and you bring us back. Uh, and we can't thank you enough for that amazing gift of your love for us. Thank you, Lord. Amen. We are Peter and Laurel Olson, and we've been serving at a school called Black Forest Academy, or BFA for short, uh, since 2006. Our connection to Salem is through Laurel's parents, Lauren, aka Pete, and Jan Peterson. And we're here this morning to give you a quick overview of what we do, give an update on the past year, and share some prayer requests as we prepare to head back to Germany. So on the next slide, you'll see a map of where BFA is located. It is less than a half hour from both the French and Swiss borders in the southwest corner of Germany. And on the next slide, you'll see our campus. BFA has students in grades 5 to 12. Our middle school, grades 5 to 8, had 40 students this past year. The high school uh, had 202 students. And of these 202 students, 111 participate in BFA's boarding program, meaning that they come to live in one of our six dorms during the school year. This past year, you'll see that our students came from over 45 countries where their parents are serving or where they're working. And a key question for us is why does a school like Black Forest Academy even exist? And part of the answer is that for missionaries meeting the educational needs of their children, not to mention their social, emotional, and spiritual needs, can become a significant challenge. This is why BFA exists and why we do what we do. BFA was started and still is primarily a school for missionary kids. Our second key question this morning um, is why does BFA have a boarding program? And the reality is that some missionaries are located in places that do not have a good or even a viable option for their kids to get a good education. And this issue becomes more common as students reach high school age. The local opportunities where they are may not be adequate. Homeschooling gets more difficult with higher level academics. Students struggle with isolation and loneliness, and that's a big one. Students want to be involved in extracurricular activities like sports, music, or drama. Sometimes a host culture for a family might be hostile or unhealthy for that student. And some students need to prepare for the re-entry into college and in their home culture. It's not an easy decision for a family to send their high school student away to a boarding school. And it's not for every student, but sometimes it's the best decision. One set of parents shared that the decision to go to Eastern Europe to the mission field was the easy one. But sending their son to BFA as a ninth grader after he was struggling in the national schools and experiencing isolation and loneliness was a much harder decision to make for them as a family. But it was the right one for that student. For some missionaries, a school like BFA can be a key factor in their ability to remain in their field of ministry. BFA is a school, and in theory, students come for an education. However, we know this isn't the whole story. Our students come for sports, music, and drama programs. They come for things like chapel services, small groups, and mentoring programs. And in many cases, they come for social connection, for relationships, which we have a sermon series here that talks about the importance of relationships. Since last summer, we've been on home ministry assignment in the USA. We wanted to have time to support our family, both our boys and our parents during this year, and that has been possible for us. We've been grateful for our ability to be present with them. After 15 years of living overseas, we don't take that for granted. Our boys are both in university in Alabama, and we've made several trips south to see them. We were able to move our youngest son, Caleb, into the dorm in the fall and then move him back out in May. And this past August, we helped our oldest son, Jonah, settle into an apartment of his own and find a car all in about a week's time. If you remember, we had shared that as a prayer request in the fall at Salem, and that was one that the Lord answered. We also traveled for several months last fall, visiting a couple supporting churches in New York, where we used to live, and supporters scattered around the eastern half of the U.S. Plans for the second half of our year were adjusted when Laurel Stad's battle with cancer intensified, and he entered Solvay Hospice House here in Duluth. 
We've spent most of our time since Christmas here. It's almost time for us to return to Germany in the next school year, and we have tickets for July 17th. In terms of our family, it's going to be a different return for us because we go back without any kids. It's a reality check when we put together a new prayer card that didn't include our boys. And the truth is that they're the ones that people are most interested in seeing. And some of them have been bold enough to tell us that when they saw the new card. <laughs> However, if you'd like to pick up a new card, though it's perhaps not improved, um, we do have some available at a table that way. <laughs> when we return to BFA, I will once again be the math department chair and be teaching high school math and physics. I'm also dusting off my programming skills to be ready to teach a computer science course for the first time. For the past 10 years, Laurel has been an assistant to the head of school, and earlier this year she was asked to switch to an admissions role as the staff person currently running that program or the admissions department is leaving at the end of August. This is a critical need for our school and she agreed to make the switch. The good news is that she's been around long enough to have a good idea of how everything works. In terms of how the world is doing, we go back during a time when there are a lot of uncertainties. COVID regulations and restrictions have had a significant impact on BFA and that impact was still felt through much of the last school year. We don't know what the next year will hold and how the German government will respond. The Russia-Ukraine situation is impacting Europe in a huge way, politically, socially, and economically. Rising costs and inflation are not confined to the USA. These are also being felt around the world. Things like global instability, politics, pandemics, economics, these all have a significant impact on the missionary community as well. Please be in prayer for this, at the same time knowing that God accomplishes his purposes despite the obstacles that we might see around us. On a personal note, Laurel's dad continues in hospice. And one thing that is certainly clear after these past months is that we don't always know or understand God's timelines. The questions of whether we or she will be able to travel on July 17, 17 is a real one to us right now. We're praying that God will make it clear as to what we should do and that we would have peace in making those decisions. We want to say a big thank you, too, to the Salem family for its partnership in our work at BFA and for being such a welcoming place to us during our HMA year. We have been encouraged by the church family here and are excited about what God is doing through all of you. So thank you. I want to take some time this morning to just pray for um, both of them. It's been such a fun year to have them around, even in the midst of all of the hardship that you guys have experienced. But God's timing is just perfect. Um, I was reminded through an um, audio book I'm listening to, and uh, kind of a quote from the book on the audio book is this, that um, life is hard, God is good. And it sounds it's like a cheesy cliche, but it's the truth, right? It's meant to hold on to that truth that God is good, but boy, sometimes life can just throw so many things at us and to hold on to, to God in all of that. And so we're just, um, we'll continue to pray for God's timing. And uh, life is hard, God is good. And um, excited to hear the updates and how God will continue to use you guys in Germany. And so let's pray for them. Um, Father God, thank you for this wonderful family. And uh, what a year. I, just many challenges. It's been a hard year, uh, but a good year. And with all of the relationships and family and visiting churches. And Lord, I pray that in the coming days that you will continue to sustain them emotionally and spiritually, give them what they need. And I pray that you will just be so present in their lives. And I pray that they'll continue to experience your Holy Spirit um, and by bringing them peace and joy in the midst of um, hard times. Uh, Lord, we pray that you will 
uh, go before them as they get ready to go back to Germany. Lord, we pray for all of the pieces to fall into place and just your timing. Thank you that you are in control of everything. And so we're grateful. Uh, it fills our hearts with peace this morning as we are reminded of that reality and that truth. And so, Lord, I pray your blessing on them. I pray your blessing on their kids. And as they say goodbye, um, to go and minister to other kids. Um, I pray that this year will be so rich for them and that they'll experience your favor and your love and your grace in all of their work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Let's give them another hand. share this morning um, several other prayer requests before I do that just say again good morning and welcome I'm Pastor Stephen Aspon if you're visiting us for the first time it is such a joy to worship with you this morning and also uh, welcome to everyone that's watching us online I know we have many families that's on vacation and they might be watching or they're just ignoring us while they're on vacation and that's okay too I won't I don't blame them um, and then we have several uh, just families that's dealing with health challenges and so we want to continue to pray for them as they um, recover and then just one more prayer request this morning uh, kind of bittersweet we've got the passing of Shirley McMillan this morning and so if we can continue to pray for Daryl and for Cindy Johnson um, they just found out they were planning on being here this morning and they were actually here and then they heard the news and so um, we want to just pray for them uh, as they as they grieve and um, we're so grateful for Shirley's life and um, she served as our coffee barista at Salem for many many years and um, just a rich history at Salem and so uh, a big loss for us but heaven is much richer uh, today and we celebrate that uh, let me pray for us and pray for them and we'll get into God's word. Father God, we all know as we reflect on seasons and the joy of new life and also the complexity of different emotions as we say goodbye and as we grieve uh, the loss of loved ones and so father we pray for daryl and for cindy and their family this morning as they grieve and we pray that your holy spirit will bring comfort um, lord the reality is um, doesn't matter how prepared you are uh, in those moments we're overwhelmed with emotions as that reality sits in and so thank you that you are our God of peace and our God of joy in the midst of hard times and Lord even for us this morning as we maybe deal with all kinds of challenges uh, I pray that we'll experience your your presence um, in our lives this morning uh, father God thank you for this opportunity to just be in your word this morning I pray that you will teach us uh, that there will be some uh, principles and lessons that we can apply in our own lives as we look at different relationships that we get to experience while we live on this earth and so we give you this time in Jesus name amen and amen if you're visiting this morning or watching um, we're part of a, a short series we're calling it relationship killers and um, last week we talked about the first thing that really kills a relationship 
is the lack of communication. So we talked a little bit about that. And uh, we will continue this week. Next week, we'll take a break because we will be at camp. And I want to encourage you, if you have the, the means and the time, please join us on camp Saturday. Uh, it's going to be a great time. Just a lot of uh, activities for the kids. This campfire Saturday night. There's a worship team. And um, we'll be able to gather together as a covenant family of all of the other covenant churches in the area. And so come on out, bring the kids, a lot of swimming, a lot of fun. And then on Sunday morning, um, we will have wonderful time of worship out there and we'll have a baptism. And so uh, looking forward to that. So please be intentional. Really want to invite you to just to come out and um, you know, join us. Um, <clears throat> last week I share this reality and this truth we are built for relationships. We really are. I mean, in a sense, when we think about just the way as we look at the Trinity and that supernatural relationship that exists within the Trinity, um, and we can kind of see that spill over in other relationships. And so we, we are, even when we look at Genesis God himself reminds us that it's not good for man to be alone. Nobody wants to be alone. We all crave relationships. Um, but within relationships, and this is going to be our first or our second relationship killer, you know, we're looking at how do we preserve relationships if we say that they're valuable. We want to do everything we can to protect our relationships. But something that really can kill a relationship is conflict. Can I hear amen? And hopefully this morning I can share with you some practical tips that will really help you. Uh, anybody experienced conflict before in a relationship? Okay, four of us. Okay, that's... I'm going to your guys' church. You're doing something, right? Those of you that have never experienced conflict... Um, but here's the reality, because people aren't perfect and relationships are messy, we all need to learn how to resolve conflicts. This is such a valuable tool and art that we need to make part of our lives. I was sharing with the, the guys this morning, there's a group of guys that, that pray early in the morning and... Um, you know, just talking through this, it's like we, we all experience conflict and we need to really learn as a society and as a culture and as a church, not just our church, but churches all over the world, how to deal with conflict. This is a key piece. I mean, probably with all the stuff, I mean, kind of when we look at politically and all the new stuff, we see all the things that kids learn in schools. I wish they want to go back and teach the kids how to deal with conflict, right? And um, key for us, and there's so much in Scripture about this topic. Uh, we can probably spend a whole month or, or more just on this topic itself, on the area of conflict. Now, because we are broken and because we experience messiness within relationships, um, and just because we're human, right? Uh, we have this, the potential for conflict is certain. <laughs> it's going to happen. If you're, if you're not in conflict right now, guess what? You might experience it next Sunday or next month. But we go through seasons where we just, we experience conflict. It's all around us. I mean, in all honesty, we experience conflict in our marriage, in the workplace, in family, unfortunately in churches, and friendships. You know, it's, uh, I was just kind of laughing this morning as I was thinking about family conflict, yeah, just growing up with my younger brother. Boy, we duked it out some days, right? In our early teenage years and the crazy things we we did. When you have siblings, 
boy, there's conflict. And you somehow, hopefully, you learn how to work that out and figure it out. And, and you want to work it out and you want to figure it out because it's family. It's like, I got to get this right. And hopefully as kids, you know, you're kind of forced to figure it out because you either share a room or you share a house. Sometimes it's more complicated as you um, turn into adults and it's not always that easy maybe as an adult, but I think it is key and that we need to to work on it. And then just over the years, when I think about all of the crazy stories within church life and some of the conflict that I've seen, um, so it's there. And then in, in friendships, you know, just again, growing up, I had so many friends. There was one particular season in this uh, town. We were in a town called Cyplos, small little town, uh, uh, mining community and one of my best friends um, uh, just kind of lived on the corner could walk there in two three minutes and you were there and it's like every week and every Friday night I would either sleep at his house or he would sleep at my house and some days there was just man we were just fighting and it's like well I'm not coming over to your house tonight right and it's like we're never going to be friends and then you know half an hour later it's like I'm at his house and sleeping there and, and just having fun. And it's just fun to reflect on those things. But as we deal with relationships, that conflict piece seems like it's always present. And how do we work through that? And how do we work through it even in our church culture? It is easy for us to think about the early church and you think oh they had it all figured out but they had many challenges as well but before I share some of those um, challenges and conflict and relationships I found this cute little story online I might have shared that before with you as well um, it says the pastor and the music director in an in old first church did not get along at all and one week, the pastor preached on commitment and how we should dedicate ourselves to service. And right after the sermon, the music director led the choir in singing, I shall not be moved. <clears throat> and the next Sunday, the pastor preached on giving and how we should gladly give to the work of the Lord. And the music director then led the song, Jesus paid it all. And then the next Sunday, the pastor preached on gossiping and how we should watch our tongues. And the following hymn was, I love to tell the story. <clears throat> and the pastor became disgusted over the situation. And the next Sunday, he told the congregation he was considering resigning. And the choir then sang, oh, why not tonight? <clears throat> And when the preacher resigned the next week, he told the church that Jesus has led him there and Jesus was taking him away. And then the choir, the choir then sang, what a friend we have in Jesus. <laughs> and so just, you know, conflict in church, uh, nothing new. And even in the early church, I mean, just when we reflect back on our study in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 6, we're reminded of the tension between uh, the Greek Jewish widows were being neglected in favor of the Hebrew Jewish uh, widows. And we saw those disciples trying to figure that out. And Galatians chapter 5, the Galatians were devouring one another because of their um, legalist zeal. Uh, James chapter 2, uh, you had class conflicts as the rich were being honored and the poor dishonored in the church. And so just... Easy to think, oh, that early church that was so wonderful, they were perfect. No, they were not perfect. They dealt with many challenges and things that we even still deal with today. But we have to learn how to deal with that in a biblical way. I found this great quote. I said that there's such a great image. It says, many of us in the church are like porcupines trying to huddle together on a bitter cold night to keep each other warm but we continually poke and hurt each other, uh, 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 hurt and hurt each other 
the closer we get. And it's like, man, that is so true. We don't try, but yet you know, our sinful nature, um, we just sometimes hurt each other. Now, I want you to write this down. This is important. As we start to look at how do we deal with conflict. Conflict resolution is an intentional choice. Many of us, depending on your personality, hates conflict. I mean, we will do anything to avoid conflict. I've seen this in my own family, Vanessa's family. You know, sometimes it's just it feels like the easy thing is to run in a different direction. I'm not going to deal with this. Uh, and so conflict is, is hard. And to try and heal and restore and to resolve, that is really hard. And you have to be very intentional with it. And so even in Matthew 18, we see, as it deals with conflicts, is if another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses, confesses it, you have won that person back. But it just it shows us that there needs to be a response, right? A lot of times we have to go out, we have to make that phone call. I want to encourage you, as you deal with conflict and different things, do not just sit and let it go. Don't think, well, just by avoiding the situation, it's going to get better. The reality is a lot of times it doesn't get better. We have to be intentional. We have to make that hard phone call. We have to write that hard letter. We have to reach out and try and say, hey, if relationships are important to God, then relationships need to be important in my life as well. And so we want to do everything we can to um, heal and restore and uh, be intentional around relationships. I think another important attitude to have is around this passage in Matthew uh, chapter 5. It says, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And here's kind of the piece that really ministered to me this week. It says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of him. But just look here. It says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. That is such a key piece to identify if we are children of God. What will follow us? There will be a peace, and this will be our attitude. When we think about relationships, we are called to be peacemakers. A lot of times people have not a good biblical concept around this word. Peacemaker or to be a peacemaker doesn't mean you just avoid or you're just a, a doormat and you don't confront. Uh, this word actually comes from uh, uh, Greek culture where a lot of times uh, a peacemaker was an ambassador that was sent into countries or a situation where there was conflict and they had to go in and then try and be uh, and trying to reconcile and in the same way for us as peacemakers we are called to reconcile one people and God to try and reconcile that relationship we're also called to be um, to help reconcile relationships within our families, within the church. That's what it means to be um, a peacemaker. Uh, but it just, it was so powerful. I was, I was just looking at that verse and I, again, looking at what's happening in our culture and in different denominations. It's like, man, we, we don't see a lot of peacemakers anymore. 
uh, those ambassadors. It's like we want to get into the middle of the fight. It seems like we want to kind of do the opposite. But it says we will be, co- uh, and they will be called children of God. Now Jesus promises that the peacemakers will be blessed by specifically being called a child of God. The Greek word translates, uh, word translated as blessed is this con- context refers to someone made happy by receiving God's favor. You want to experience God's favor? Be a peacemaker. And you'll read kind of that same concept within uh, James. I think it's James chapter 3. So some other things that we can focus on as we deal with uh, conflict and relationships, and we have to look at James chapter 4. So if you have your um, Bible with you, please turn to James chapter 4, and we'll just look at um, verse 1 and 2 on some practical things, and you might not like these practical concepts on what it will take to deal with conflict. So if you have your scripture with you, it says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but to do, sorry, you desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. Uh, just that word, uh, what causes fights and quarrels, is actually, uh, when you translate it from the Greek, it talks about war. And so he's, uh, James is actually just saying, hey, this is such an extreme case. Some, it's amazing how something small, and maybe you have experienced this, or maybe you have witnessed this, where there's maybe a, a small little conflict, and how something small can really turn into a war. And a lot of times when you look at those things and you look back, it's like, how did we get here? How did things get so messy? This was something so small, and now we have turned this into into war uh, and just how messy that is and so here's something I want you to write down as we deal with conflict how do we resolve conflict when we look at this passage here it is check your own heart and stop the blaming (laughs) write that down check your own heart and stop the blaming Just when we look at this passage again, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? Um, It is so easy to blame the other person, right? We want to go there immediately when there's conflict. And it's like, well, there's something wrong with them. There's something wrong, you know, it's like uh, amazed Growing up and my brother and stuff, I was so easy to blame him and even to get him into trouble, right? And anything went wrong and stuff that I was guilty of and I had some issues, it's like, man, I'm going to blame my poor brother or blame the other person. But James is asking us to hold up that mirror. He says the first thing we need to do when we are dealing with conflict in relationships, whatever that context of that relationship might be this is a great question to ask say hey what is going on in my own heart what do I need to bring before the Lord Um, is there more to the story because a lot of times we are blinded by our own shortcomings we're blinded by our own mistakes and, and blind spots and we might miss out uh, and so we need those mo- um, honest time with God to just say, God, what's going on in my heart? And to deal with that. And then just to stop the blaming. I mean, we even see it today in our culture again, right? It's, it's always the other guy. And what if we can take a pause and just say, okay, I'm not going to blame the other person in this relationship, but let me just make sure. 
Let me make sure that on my side, things are okay. And um, my heart is sorted out and, and in good standing with, with the Lord. And then number two, repent and pray. Repent and pray. This passage reminds us again, kind of when you, even when you read the rest of the passage, I'm only giving you part of it, but when you go and read verse 3, it says you do not have because you do not ask God. Prayer is so key. I mean, a lot of times when we think about conflict, how many of us really pray about it? How many of us really seek the Lord first before we uh, address that conflict? We need to create that moment where we just we pray, we um, soak it in prayer, and pray for the other person that is involved, and to trust the Lord and to seek for wisdom, and then to repent as well. I mean, if there's some fault in your own life, and um, you know repent um, but these are key internal things that we need to address as we look at conflict resolution and then um, seek amen that's an amen I like it seek restoration rather than retaliation can I hear amen Romans chapter 12, it says, Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And again, in our society, and we see all of the things that's going on, it is so easy to live into that action and that emotion, right? When people hurt us, and when we go through conflict, and that emotion is like so many times because we are hurting, guess what? What's the next thing? We want to take revenge. We want to hurt somebody else. And so scripture is just say, hey, this is not the way, right? Leave that with God. It's not our place to go and take revenge. We're called to peacemakers. And so even this invitation uh, from last week, as we think about this summer, to use this season and for the Holy Spirit to maybe um, convict us about areas, different relationships that we can grow in. Relationships are important to God, and it needs to be important to us. Um, a lot of times, we as believers, easy for us to say, well, you know, I'm biblical, and I'm biblical in the things that I want to be biblical on. But if we say we're going to follow God's word, then as believers, it's important for us to say, well, let me allow God's word uh, to work through all areas of my life. As believers, we don't get to pick and choose. It's like, okay, I'm going to be biblical in this area. And it's like, man, doesn't matter what the situation, man, this is what God's word is and what God's word is saying, and I'm going to act this way. But then on the other end of things, then we kind of just avoid God's word and we don't act in that way. And so let's bring it all through. When we think about relationships, then we got to apply God's word as well and the way that we deal with conflict. Um, let's allow the Holy Spirit to restore relationships uh, this year. And even if it's not in your hands, because that makes it really difficult, right? When you want to restore a relationship, but the other person is not ready. And uh, they don't act in a biblical way. And then what do you do then? Well, I believe you kind of just wait for God's timing and his season, and you, you pray that through. We've, I've had that in seasons in my own life where you just kind of 
and it's frustrating, right? When you want to go out and you want to be biblical and then the person just isn't ready. And then you, you just pray and allow the Holy Spirit to do its thing. And then you look for those open doors. It's amazing how the Lord will open up the right door, right season. And it's like, okay, there it is. And then for us to walk through it. Um, when it comes to conflict resolution, uh, I don't have a specific scripture, but I was just thinking about it this week. I actually asked the team, I said, what's some stuff that really kills relationship? And they had several topics. I, con did, uh, I think some of you guys said conflict, right? Um, but I, I was thinking about my own life and dealing with conflict. The number one thing that usually that tries to stop me from restoring a relationship is pride, right? Um, we have all kinds of excuses. Um, and God, it, it really takes a spirit of humbleness and humility to, to work on these things, to be on that place and say, I'm going to make that, that phone call. Because there's always that excuse to say, well, you know, I, I think back my, and I've shared many of you that the season I went through a really hard time with relationship and conflict with my dad. And then to make that phone call and to write that letter. And it's like, well, he's the dad. He's older. He should know, right? And immediately kind of pride and stuff in my own heart or easy to say well he's at fault or excuses but to be on that place to have humility and to say you know what I'm gonna step up uh, I'm gonna take the first action and so it really starts I think with humility and so may God bless us with humility as we work on all of these relationships and may God give you great wisdom and I want to encourage us as parents and even as we speak this morning to dads I think um, in the coming years we have a profound role first of all to be an example on how to deal with conflict but to teach our kids how to deal with conflict and I don't know about you, but at least the way I grew up, nobody showed me. I had no idea. And yet it is such an important skill to have. And a lot of times you're just kind of thrown into deep waters and you swim and you mess up and you think about all of the damage that's being done a lot of times. But what if we can help our kids and say, this is what scripture is teaching us go and apply this uh, in your lives um, I, I think that will be very helpful for them I'll close with one story we moved from one town to another town I was maybe about fifth grade and um, there was just one of those annoying kids you know it's like blaming it's like there's always it's always the other kid. It really was the other kid, this case. And um, man, he just poked fun every opportunity that he had. And uh, it was one day I, the teacher left the classroom and suddenly I just had enough breaking point, right? And we just duked it out right in the classroom. It wasn't pretty. And afterwards, this guy, I, you're embarrassed by what happened, and it really didn't solve the situation. But then the funny thing that happened, we had to move, uh, had to go into, uh, because we moved, we started to become members of a new church. And his dad became my Sunday school teacher. And then even worse, he's in my Sunday school classroom. And so you, you sit with all of this, 
And the cool thing is we figured it out and we became good friends. And so the Lord can restore all relationships. Don't give up on relationships. Fight for them because it is worth it. And we are created for relationships. Let's, let's pray. Uh, Father God, thank you for relationships and the blessing of friendships and all of the different relationships that we experience in our lives and, and how it teaches us to relate with you, uh, what it teaches us about community, what it teaches us about our own sinful nature. And so, Lord, I pray that Salem will be known for healthy relationships. Lord, I pray that this summer that will be intentional. You know, we, we all have some of those relationships that's uh, not flourishing. And I pray that you will come and do a miracle. Even when we think maybe our siblings, our spouses, um, friends, church, Holy Spirit, we invite you into all of those relationship pieces. And will you come and heal and restore? And may you be glorified um, as we deal with conflict. Teach us, help us to be a biblical example to the next generation. Lord, in even to our world, as our world deals with conflict and all of the politics and things that's going on. Lord, I pray that the church will be such an example uh, on how to deal with conflict. Um, we pray all of these things in your wonderful name, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand together. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. I was breathing but not alive. All my failures I tried. You hide. It was my dream till I met you. You called my name and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness into your glorious day. Called my name and I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day. Now your mercy saved my soul. I know the old made you Jesus when I met you you called my name and I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day called my name and I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day I 
needed rescue My sin was heavy Chains break at the weight of your glory I needed shelter I was an orphan Now you call me a citizen of heaven When I was broken You were my healing Now your love is the air that I'm breathing Have a future My eyes are open Cause when you call my name out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day, you called my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Uh, God, we've been in conflict with sin from the moment we're born, Lord. And, and when, we, when you walked out of that grave, Lord, and you called us out uh, to come out of our own sins, Lord, you, you broke that conflict. Uh, and Lord, I just pray that that would be the model that we use, Lord, in, in our own lives as we, as we become peacemakers in our own circles of influence, uh, Lord, that the gospel would permeate our own lives uh, and, and that people would see your love in us, uh, and that through you, we, we could break down those barriers that separate us, Lord. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we praise you and we love you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Let me go in peace. Hey, you made it to the end of this video. So if you're interested in learning more about Salem and getting connected with us, check out the description box of this video because there's a ton of links uh, that you can click on to find out more. And let me point out the connect card. It's your way of starting a conversation with us about God, about our church via a phone call or an email. So please fill that out if you're interested. All right, we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.